Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, as usual, uh, my name is Dr. Nathan Tai. I'm the organizer of the series, along with, with, with Mr. Walsh at the Carnegie Public Library. Um, and we're very excited that you're taking time out of your very busy uh, Ash Wednesday and Valentine's Day <laughs> to spend some time with us at the Public Library today. Um, as always, we're very, very happy um, and, and want to send a very uh, hearty thanks to the Carnegie Public Library for sponsoring this series. We've been doing this for over five years now, um, and it's, it's always been a really uh, you know, wonderful endeavor and, and opportunity to share you know, some, some really exciting stories with folks in the community. Um, we have upcoming talks. Um, our next talk in March, which, which is not on the second Wednesday as typical because we have spring break on campus, so we're all going to be going to warmer climes. Um, so March 6th, um, we're going to have uh, Dr. William Stoudemire, as well as uh, his undergraduate research fellow, uh, Logan Osmera, talking about Jenner's Park, which for those of you who don't know is a unusual uh, zoo, amusement park, and museum that, that operated in Loop City. And if you hadn't seen, they were just on uh, Nebraska Stories on Nebraska Public Media last week, uh, talking about this research and, and the work that they have done. Um, and then April 10th, uh, we'll be joined uh, by Brock Anderson, uh, who is an instructor in the history department here and sitting in the third row in the bright red polo, um, <laughs> talking about uh, the, the red shirt winter cap, which, which is an important uh, Lakota uh, document that he was able to identify, locate, and, and repatriate to the red shirt family. So it's going to be a really um, important story that, that's going to come from, from Brock with us. Um, so for those who um, you know, want to find out more events, more things that are happening in the history department, we have all of the requisite uh, social media accounts and you, you can follow us there. Um, we also um, have an events email list. Um, so if you want to know kind of comings and goings and things from the history department and the sign up for that list is on the back table. So please, um, you can get announcements for, for brown bags, book talks, other things that are kind of happening with our, our students and others. Um, and then finally, um, you know, if you want to support our students, which, which this is, you know, an, an incredible um, project that Tanya has been working on for quite some time, um, we do have, the, the, there's a QR code that, that's also on the table back there um, to support research funds and scholarships for our students like Tanya. But without further ado, um, we are going to be discussing the Sioux Ordinance Depot today. And our speaker is, is Tatiana Moore. Um, a graduate student at UNK studying public history, and, and she has spent some time with us. She, she received her, her bachelor's of education um, in uh, social science 712 with us in 2020, um, taught social studies in the public school system before returning with us, um, and has produced a, a wide amount of research in her time, uh, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student, has produced digital history projects on uh, airmen's uh, letters about the Alliance Air Base, um, has actually published about uh, war brides um, in uh, the Pacific, um, and is very interested in World War II and, and post-World War history, as well as the Asian American experience during these periods. Um, she's an incredible student, this is an incredible project, um, and with this, we're looking for folks who can help or might have stories related to this. Um, so these will be at the back table, kind of a summary of the talk, and then a QR code that takes you to a survey. So if you have information, if, if relatives, if, if you know somebody, your neighbor, um, someone might have something that can help tell the story of the Sioux Ordinance Depot, please pick one of these up so I can share. Um, again, they're, they're at the back table. Um, and then the final thing that I, I wanna share with everybody, and, and I hope we can um, direct this at her, today's her birthday. <laughs> so can we all say happy birthday, Tommy? Happy birthday to you. Twelve o'clock high. Twelve o'clock high. I've never seen that one either. 
Longest day? Longest day? That's a good one too. Fury. Fury, that's a really good one. Any others? Saving Private Ryan. Bridge Over Ever Quiet, Saving Private Ryan. Those are great movies. Okay, so we're all here to talk about history, right? Why am I asking you about movies? Well, as Dr. Kai mentioned, I study public history. Oh, can you hear me? I don't think it's on. Oh, it may not be on. So 
before World War II even sparked for America, there was already speculation in Sydney that they would be receiving an ammunition storage site. Um, we see this as early as October 1941. There's an article that's released um, that says that Congressman Harry B. Coffey had written a letter to the mayor of Sydney saying that Sydney was up for consideration in um, an ammunition storage site. They had seen surveyors around town at this time, um, but there were no official reports. Of course, they're not going to say what they're actually doing there. It's government for a little bit. Um, but when this article comes out, people start talking because they've connected the dots and they finally realize, oh, something's coming. Um, unfortunately, Sydney is not chosen at this time for a site. On January, or in January 1942, the Army announces that um, they have selected a different site to receive an ammunition. This one ends up being in Edgemont, South Dakota, which is in the Black Hills region, so it's really just straight north of Sydney. Um, for some people, this was pretty depressing. They were looking forward to new business in the area. Um, this is when we're starting to have the depression, so there's, there's some hope on the horizon for this. Others thought, you know, there might be some good that comes out of this. Um, in the midst of the discussion of whether or not Sydney was going to receive a depot, there was an editorial released in the newspaper called Envy or Pity. And in it, the author basically says, you know, the consequences of having a government facility may not outweigh the benefits. And the author talks mostly about the agricultural impacts of this, um, but there were some that held this opinion. In the article, we'll look right here, um, they say, maybe in the long run, the payroll and its accompanying boom will more than pay for the losses. Maybe, we say, but we doubt it. So there were some of these attitudes happening at the time, but there were still some who remained optimistic that something would happen. And it turns out there was reason to hold on to hope. In early 1942, the major chief of police um, was seeking two more ordnance sites. Um, at the time, they said that Western Nebraska was going to receive one of these, and in comes Congressman Coffey again, and he says, Sydney is up for consideration here. There's no other Western Nebraska city mentioned, so this time it's it. We're going to get it. Um, according to government reports, they reconsidered Sydney because they said it was well suited for their needs um, and it was well isolated. In early March 1942, they received the official authorization that Sydney is going to receive an ammunition storage site. Um, the second one that is built is in Poole, Utah. So that becomes Sydney's sister plant. Um, and a few months later, construction begins. When all of this is said and done, um, Sydney ends up occupying an area of about 19,771 acres. This map shows um, the land that it had in the field. Um, with construction underway, the newspaper releases an article and says that Sioux has become part of a vital defense territory. At the time, Western Nebraska and the Panhandle has three major military installations that are coming. There's one in Sydney, one in Scotts Bluff, and one in Olenia. But I really like this phrase, vital defense territory, because I think it speaks more to what the entire state of Nebraska is experiencing. Now, you'll have to forgive me. This is a very rough map, so don't plot all these points. <laughs> Um, but during World War II, Nebraska had a lot of military installations. Um, these are just some of the major ones that we saw. So you may be familiar with some. Um, the Kearney Army Air Base here in town. Um, there was the Hastings Naval Ammunition Depot. Um, the Martin Bomber Plant in Omaha, which is where they built the Enola Gay. Um, the Cornhusker Plant in Grand Island. You might also be familiar with stories about the North Platte Canteen which would have been right about here. Um, and the POW camp at Atlanta, which is gonna be kind of south of us here. So looking at this, you can see that Sydney is not the only city in Nebraska to receive a military installation. But this Ordnance Depot does have its own unique history to contribute to Nebraska's story. So back to our depot. Um, by mid-October, Progress on this depot is progressing very quickly. Um, the newspaper goes to the commanding general and they're asking him, hey, when's it officially gonna open? And uh, Major Preble says, well, there's really no policy that says I can't tell you, but what he does say is, quote, 
there could be no possible good come from a policy announcing when and where we begin storing ammunition at the depot. Which I can understand, you don't want to tell everybody when you've got all of the ammunition there. So they don't <coughs> officially announce an opening, but the government records show that in December 1942, they started receiving um, supplies and ammunition. So this begins the 25 year long operation of the depot. Okay. So, <coughs> Why do we call this an underdog story? Well, if we think about, here are my movie references again, um, movies like The Karate Kid or Rocky, it's typically a story about a character who doesn't really stand a chance, right? The reason that this is an underdog story is because Sydney at the time was a city of about 9,000 people, not really well known, and they were given the opportunity to compete against other military installations in the state but as well as the rest of the nation. They had to compete with other states to even get one of these places. So the War Department's decision to locate one of these military installations in Sydney provides that opportunity for competition. The employees are going to receive many awards and accolades throughout their time. Uh, this is one of them, and it has this on for it. Uh, construction on the depot was finished about six months it was scheduled. And all of the people who contributed to that received a medal. Um, it's about this big. So here's just a large version of that for you. Um, but the medals read, presented to one who made possible completion of the combat equipment storage area at Sioux Ordnance Depot ahead of schedule with a sincere appreciation of the area and his work there. Um, on a side note, this medal was actually how I became introduced to this project. Miss Alta Young, where are you, dear? Go ahead and wave. Um, this is her father's medal, and she found this in her jewelry box one day and wanted to know more information about it. Um, she decided to go to the Armed Forces Recruiting Center here in town and was looking for the Army. Lucky for me, the Army wasn't home that day, um, but there was a Marine. Um, and that Marine is my fiance, who is working as a recruiter here in town. So, he politely told Miss Elta that uh, he had no idea what he was looking at and didn't know if he could help, but his girlfriend was a historian. So I connected with Miss Elta and that's why we're all here today. So thank you, Miss Elta, for sharing your story with me. Okay, so this is just one of the awards that the employees are going to receive, but the depot also receives lots of awards. I won't talk about all of these, but just a few to note are their merits for safety, um, and their award for the employment of people with disabilities. If the War Department had not decided to locate one of these in Western Nebraska, Sydney would not have had the opportunity to compete. Therefore, this is our underdog story. Okay. okay. We're talking about World War II here, right? If we're talking about movies in World War II, I feel like we need an action movie. Anybody else agree there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, there are lots of tales of danger and action to be found at the depot. So we're gonna call this one Adventures in a Vital Defense Territory. First of all, the very essence of the depot implies danger, okay? When the, the depot first opened, the mission was the receipt, storage, and issue of army ammunition, <coughs> ammunition components, and general supplies. Now, throughout its history, the depot's going to be participating in warehousing procedures and demilitarization processes, but this remains the main mission throughout its history. <laughs> what this implies then is that employees are always going to be dealing with ammunition, ammunition components, danger, right? Um, <laughs> those employees are going to handle a lot of ammunition. They saw everything from small arms to large arms. Um, these are just a few of the ammunition types you would have seen. This one right here is a 105 millimeter howitzer shell. These two over here are bombs. Um, this is a 100 pound bomb and a 250 pound bomb. Um, they also had really large ammunition at the depot. They saw 1,000 pound bombs and 4,000 pound bombs, but ammunition was not the only thing they're storing over here. Um, they had tank parts, automobiles, um, office machines and supplies, really anything you would need to set up a base somewhere else. The employees know that what they're handling here is dangerous stuff, 
So they take their precautions and they try to be as careful as they can. They won awards for their safety, but accidents are still gonna happen, okay? When I was first researching the depot, I found that initial construction included 802 pitches. Um, this is a map of the depot territory. In the blue are all of the igloos. So I found 802 of those. Um, this is an image of them being constructed at the time, and this is what one looks like today. In the oral histories that I conducted though, um, a lot of people were saying there were 801 igloos. But I found two. Where'd the other one go? Well, what I found is that that one probably disappeared in an explosion. On December 2nd, 1947, um, there was a major accident at the depot. Now the report showed that this was a complete accident. Nobody was at fault. It just happened. Um, workers were removing ammunition from an igloo. It was J601. Um, and in this process, an M3 spotting charge detonated. When they went in and did their investigation, they found that the safety charge or safety pin in that charge had been moved. So what that meant is that the box the charge was in had moved or jostled in any way, an explosion would occur, which it did. Um, that ignition set off more explosions and ended up destroying the igloo and claiming the life of one employee. So that's where our missing igloo went. There are 801. Um, another major incident occurred in October of 1954 when there was a fire in the normal maintenance building. Um, their investigation of this incident showed that there was a failure to cut an ignition wire during the demilitarization process. Um, this is an image from the National Archives. And you can see it indicates where one side was cut, but not the other. Um, failure to do that then caused the ignition during the process. Um, the result was fire in the building it caused $34,000 worth of damage, but thankfully nobody was injured in this incident. Um, the captions on here just show you what the area looked like. So this is the west end of the building, um, right after the fire, and then this is the east end, kind of at the same spot. Okay. So an action movie could definitely incorporate some of these dangerous events at the depot, but it could also incorporate stories of adventure. And if we're talking about adventure, I think we need to focus on the employees at the depot. Um, the Sioux Ordnance Depot was going to face a major issue with finding people to work at the depot. Locating a military installation in the middle of nowhere has its perks, but finding a large employment pool is probably not one of them. Um, but that doesn't stop the personnel from finding solutions. Over the years, they are going to employ all sorts of people. Um, women in traditional and non-traditional roles, soldiers from a base in Wyoming, the sugar beet workers and farmers in their off-season, high school students in the summer months, Japanese Americans in confinement sites, um, people with physical disabilities, and prisoners of war, or POWs. Now, if we're talking about an action movie, I think the POWs would have the best story for this case. Um, in fact, this is one of the most discussed stories at the depot. In 1943, in the spring, South Bluff opens up a POW camp. Um, it was one of two POW camps in the western part of the state. The other one is at Fort Robinson, which is up here. Um, and this just shows you how far that is from the station. Um, South Bluff started to house Italian POWs there in 1943, and shortly thereafter sent about 300 of them down to Sydney to work. Um, the Italians filled a variety of roles at the depot, However, they were governed by the Geneva Convention of 1929, which expressly forbade their use in military dealings and things such as ammunition, so they couldn't be working in those areas. But the depot commanders tried to find places where they could work um, and often worked with their own abilities. So if an Italian POW was skilled at working on cars, he often ended up in a garage working with other mechanics. Um, if he spoke English very well, they would put them in the offices rather than outside The POWs could also be used for farm labor. So a farmer could come to the depot one day, pick up a few Italian POWs, take them back to the fields to work, and then bring them back in the afternoon. Um, I know that I've only
only got pictures of two Italian POWs up here, but they are not the only ones that are going to be used by the depot. Um, in 1943, Italy surrenders. We've got the changing war landscape, which also impacts the home front area. Um, our Italian POWs are given a little more freedom. They're assigned to different units. And then in Scott's Bluff, the German POW starts to be housed. When they arrive there, Scott's Bluff sends them down to Sioux, and some of them work there as well. And we end up with about 300 at the depot here. What's interesting, though, is there is a clear distinction in the treatment of both groups. And a lot of that has to deal with who was still at war with America at the time. But looking back at the histories, most of the time the Italian POWs are perceived with a more positive attitude um, and more accepting, whereas the Germans are not. Um, I have not come across any escape attempt stories yet, but supposedly there was an incident of sabotage. Um, this is from an article by Ralph Spencer, who wrote about the POWs in Western Alaska. Um, he had interviewed Mrs. Lois Stewart, and she knew a story of sabotage. Now, according to Mrs. Stewart, there was an incident once where the German POW was driving a truck, and supposedly he knew how to do this, but he deliberately drove into the firewall and broke out a lot of bricks. I haven't found any other stories like this, but like I said, the Italian POWs are often perceived a little more positively at the depot. Um, overall, when the POWs were at the depot, they seemed to assist in whatever, whatever areas they were put in, and they helped so if we combine those danger stories with um, any of the experiences that one of these POWs would have had to endure to get to the center of the state, I think we've got a pretty good action movie going on. All right, lastly, since it is Valentine's Day, we would be remiss not to talk about the romance at the depot. Um, real. I also think that romance movies pair very well with historical drama. Do I have any Hello Harbor fans out there? Yeah. <laughs> So with this last movie, we're gonna call it Love and Drama in a Vital Defense Territory. But there really is no shortage of romance at this depot. So we're gonna go back to talking about our POWs here. Um, this is Emmanuel Cantanella, and his story is one of the most famous at the depot, and it's all about love. Um, so Campy here, as you probably know, um, was in the Italian army during World War II. He was captured by the British in Tunisia, and found his way to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. When he was at the POW camp in Scotts Bluff, he worked as a janitor for about six months, um, and then they reassigned him to Sydney. So he came down to the Stuart Depot and um, initially worked on the railroad there, but he contracted pneumonia while doing that. Um, so after his recovery, the doctor said, can you do anything else? And Kimmy's like, I didn't even know how to do railroad work before. <laughs> So they reassigned him to electrical work, which was something he was more familiar with. Um, and he worked on fixing forklifts and any electrical issues that they had on the base, or the depot, excuse me. Um, and that's how he met his future wife. Um, Edith Rother was a forklift operator hired by the depot. And uh, Campy had seen her a few times, kind of knew who she was, um, but he'd have to work in a building. So whatever building she was in, he would make sure to be there, kind of bump into her talk to her. Um, he said they got to have lunch a few times too because this is the point where um, some of those rules have relaxed a little bit for Italians. Um, so they started a little romance at the depot. He stayed there for about two years and then in 1945 they shipped him back to Italy. And before he left he told Edith, if you come to Genoa, Italy, where I'm from, I will marry you. So she did and they did. <laughs> um, when they found out she was expecting their first child, um, he decided to send her back to the States so that their daughter would be born here. Um, he arrived in Sterling, Colorado, and the next day his daughter was born. So, perfect timing. Um, they had four children together, and they lived together until the 1960s when Edith passed away from kidney problems. Uh, Campanella is not the only one to find love at the depot. There are tons of other employees who met their spouses there. Um, Vince Schmidt was one of those. So Vince was in the Navy. Um, after he was in the Navy, he worked at the depot for about three years, between 1951 and 1954. He started out as a munitions handler, um, then became a lift operator and a semi-truck driver. 
Um, his sister also works at Google. She called the headquarters building, and that was how he met his wife. So this is them on their wedding day. Um, so these are just a few of the many love stories at the depot. But I'm thinking if we're talking about the employees and some of their experiences, this romance drama movie could also feature the experiences of the Japanese Americans at this site. Um, during World War II, there were 120,000 Japanese Americans who were removed from their homes on the West Coast and put in more <coughs> interior locations. Um, at the time, they were called relocation centers by the War Relocation Authority. Survivors have called these places concentration camps. Um, others have referred to them as internment camps or incarceration camps. The National Park Service actually recommends that we call them confinement sites or incarceration sites to remove some of that fluffy language. Um, there were 10 confinement sites, and on this map they're noted by stars. So there was Tule Lake and Manzanar in California, Topaz in Utah, Tucson and Gila River in Arizona, Amachi in Colorado, Mini Delta in Idaho, Park Mountain in Wyoming, and then Jerome and Roar in Arkansas. Um, there are several other Department of Justice sites and things like that on this map too. Um, it's important to note that most of the Japanese Americans put in these confinement sites were American citizens. You may hear the term Nisei used to describe them, and that means second generation, so they were the second generation born in America. Um, but you've all also noticed, on this map there's none in Nebraska. So how did the Japanese Americans from the con these confinement sites end up at Sue? The short answer is that some of them were permitted to work outside of the, the sites. Um, so like I said, Sue was going to struggle with employing people throughout its history. Um, in the fall of 1944, they are in dire straits. They are behind on mission quotas. They have nobody else in Cheyenne County to come and work for them, so they plead to Washington, D.C. for some help. The depot commanders write a letter to D.C. telling them about their situation. <laughs> D.C. writes them back and says, recruit from the confinement sites. So they do. Um, they start to put advertisements in the confinement site newspapers, and they end up recruiting a lot from Mini Delta in Idaho and Amachi in Colorado. Um, <coughs> Larry Mullman had written a short history about the Soul Depot. Um, and in it, he says, the Nisei, they, became an indispensable part of the community and proved to be highly valued employees. Um, and you can see, this is an image of three Japanese Americans. They're stacking the ammunition inside of an igloo. So some of them did come out of those confinement sites and work at the depot. Huh. It's also important to note that not all of the Japanese Americans at Sioux were from the confinement sites. Um, Western Nebraska has a long history of Japanese settlement. Um, if you've attended any of Dickie Shepler's talks, um, you might be familiar with that. We also have some famous Nebraskans who are Japanese, um, Father Kano, for one, and Ben Kuroki. Uh, those two figures are going to be um, popular around this time. However, we do know for sure that there were some that came from the confinement sites. Um, these are just some of the, the war relocation photos that depict them. So again, here are a couple guys in an igloo stacking ammunition. Um, and these guys, I believe, are in like a, a train cart. I don't know if there's a term for that. <laughs> but they're in there stacking ammunition too. OK, so one more piece of this drama movie should include our employees with physical disabilities. Um, this is one of the most recent stories that I've come across, um, so I'm still learning about this. But in most World War II history accounts, we don't see a lot of discussion about employees with physical disabilities. However, recent research has shown that um, some of these people were highly sought after by military installations. For example, there was a plant in Milwaukee that was seeking women to work at. They said they had a special skill because they could work in really loud places and they didn't have to teach them sign language because they already knew it. Um, so that's just one example of this. This is a time before we have the Equal Opportunities Employer and other accessibility laws. 
So it's really interesting that during World War II, we've got people with disabilities working in these capacities. Um, I first came across this story in a short summary of the depot's history. It was actually from the 1960s. And it was this photograph um, with a caption. It kind of has some dated language. But it read, um, Hubert John's record at Sue doesn't show any effects of the rheumatoid arthritis from which he suffered. Mr. John, a painter at the depot, is typical of the many handicapped workers employed at the depot. So it's also interesting excuse me, um, <laughs> to see what they considered disabilities at the time, too. Um, on our awards page, we saw that the depot won many awards for its employment of people with physical disabilities. Um, these three men appeared in a newspaper article um, also, interestingly, all three of these men had lower <coughs> um, disabilities. So, like I said, this is still a story that I'm researching, but I think it would be very interesting to include in a uh, drama movie about the employees. Whew, okay. I don't know about all of you guys, but if that's not enough material for Hollywood to work with for a movie, I don't know what else I want. <laughs> We've only covered a handful of stories from the depot um, over the first like four or five years of its history. This depot was open through 1967. Um, June 30th is when it closes its doors. So we still have like 15 to 20 years of history to cover. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> um, when it closed, uh, the depot changed hands for a time to Western Nebraska Technical Community College um, owned part of it. Um, now there is a, a trucking company that owns it, and most of this is private property nowadays. Um, they recommend, actually the advice that was given to me, is that you don't go out to see the igloos because it's private property, um, but if you know somebody out there, it's okay. Um, or if you do go out, just stay on the street. Don't get out of your car and go walk around them. Um, actually, in the last few months, they've had some braking issues, so it's really not recommended. But people use them for storage nowadays, too. So still using the same people. Um, yeah. Um, like I said, I'm still researching this. So if you know anybody who knows something or you know something, I would love to connect with you um, to talk about this. But I really think that the material here is fascinating. We can learn a lot about Nebraska's military history, Nebraska's World War II history. And I really hope someday we get to see a movie about all of this. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Any questions? Yes. Did the uh, POWs or the internment camp uh, people get wages as they worked? They were paid, yes. Um, I talked with a woman whose mother worked, so she was incarcerated in Wachi in Colorado, and she had kept a diary while she was going through this, and she ended up working at the depot and had written that it was a big deal that they were getting paid for the work they were doing. So yes, they did receive compensation. Yes. How did they acquire those 19,000 acres for the depot? They, yes, they purchased them um, from farmers. Uh -huh. So there were about 35 farmers that were removed from their homes. Uh -huh. um, I actually talked with a woman whose family had just bought a property out there right before all of this happened. Uh -huh. um, and the government came in and said, we're gonna buy this, this area. And her mom spent all this time designing the kitchen and where things were going to go, and they never got to live in the house. So, yes? There is a, a, a small housing development in Northwest City. Was that part of the, the housing for the, the employees at the depot? Yes, yes. So they had, um, they built a section called Ordville, which was right off of the depot. I don't know if my map has it. Um, it's actually on this other side. They also had a trailer camp area before they established more housing for the workers. Yes, so you're exactly right. Any others? Yes. Was there an airport in the there that they took that or that orbit out of? Yeah, they they did have an airport. A lot of their activity is going to happen on the railroad. Um, you can kind of see it in this in these pictures, but the railroad went through the depot, so that's how most. photo, is it possible to see the pattern where all those igloos were? On this one? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, so this, <laughs> this is a screen grab from Google, but if you go in, um, you can see this is the area where all those issues are. Um, and you can see they're dotted in the rows. So what's funny, um, somebody I interviewed had said, the idea was to keep all of this covert, right? Nobody was supposed to see where these were or, or anything about them, except for the fact that there is a road leading up to every single one of them and a concrete pad in front of them. <laughs> so the igloo may have been hidden, but all the stuff getting there was not. So are the majority still there? Yes, they do have 801 left. Yep, yep, just that one exploded. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, okay. So were any of the did they hire any veterans after the war? They did. Um, so I'm trying to remember which one. One of these guys was hired in 1955 okay. and had a wound he received from okay. World War II. Okay. Um, this guy was hired during World War II. Okay. So they will employ veterans afterward. Right. And on the other question, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> history outside of the, the marker that it has? So um, the Fort, I'm trying to get the whole name, it's the Fort Sydney and Commander's House Museum mm -hmm. um, has a whole room that's dedicated to this place. Um, I spent lots of hours there. Actually, my friend Tess was the one who recommended it. I head out there to see it. Um, they've got pictures, some of the ones that I have here. Um, there's mock ammunition there. They have a lot of um, artifacts from the Italian POW camps there. It's a really neat place. So there's a whole room that's dedicated to this history and some of these employees as well. Okay. Yes, sir. In uh, Northern Oregon, I taught in a community there about 40 years ago. Okay. There was one of these in Northern Oregon, similar to what you showed. Okay. Uh, we were able to actually go in the igloo. Oh, really? At that time, 40 years ago, it was huge. Yeah. Huge. It was a hot. Uh, my question to you is: mm -hmm. all of these were covered with turf, with dirt, mm -hmm. and uh, the instructor or guide said it prevents for the fear of the Japanese coming over and bombing mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they couldn't see it from the air. So I don't know. Yeah. So that's. Saying the idea was to conceal all of these things. Um, the government had reconsidered their deed for a site because they felt it was in the middle of nowhere, you know, nobody's going to know where this is, except for all the roads leading up to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, 
a big igloo. Um, but yeah, that was the idea was to conceal them from the enemy if they were to come. Um, Nebraska was a great site because it was simple. So that's why we had so many military installations here at that time. Yes, you talked a little about the different uh, opinion and treatment of Italian versus German POWs in mm -hmm. Oscar time. Did you find anything similar with the opinion toward um, Japanese internment workers? Um, so I've done a little bit of digging on that. Before any Japanese Americans committed to working at the depot, there were three who visited from Mini Delta. Um, and that purpose was to gauge the climate. They wanted to see how they would be received, how Sydney would treat them, what walking around the depot would be like, um, what the schools were like. And overall, they had a, a very positive um, opinion after that. So I haven't seen any pushback from that other than a few editorials that are asking people to really consider, do we want um, essentially the same people that are going over there fighting here. But there's very little of that after they actually arrive. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Bale? Tony, thank you for this, this is awesome. Um, I guess I have a question about like, it just goes beyond your presentation a little bit, but um, what kind of, um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, what, what kind of role did it have in the Cold War, like in the Korean conflict? Did it, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, so I'm still digging into that, yeah. that era, um, but it was active. So after World War II, um, they started the demilitarization process. Mm. So all of those bases they have around the world, they're starting to ship stuff back. It has to be taken apart. They have to blow up some stuff to get rid of it. Uh, so they're in that process. Then when the Korean War starts, they're seeking employees again. So, yeah. Hey, we got to ramp up production again. So they've got all the stuff coming in, and it really just continues through the depot system. Okay. Cool. Yes, sir. In, in answer to Dr. Bale's question, um, your the title of your presentation is is really good because it's vital to the U.S. defense, but it still is today. Um, after World War II, they positioned. I think at least 100 nuclear ICBM missiles around Sydney. And uh, when Reagan was president, he, he had a campaign to uh, put in new missiles that were called the Minute Man. What was that name? Called the yeah. X, they had 10 warheads. That's what I remember. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's but okay. anyway, um, today, now they're preparing to uh, put in a new generation of Thank you all for coming today. I really enjoyed um, seeing you and getting